So that was the area for the Kaith slice right there. And before we were using the R function. So R was F of theta. So we're gonna keep using that notation here. So this will be one half F theta squared delta theta. So that's area of the kth piece. So now we're ready to put the total area, meaning we're gonna add up all of the area. We will in a minute, yeah. That'll be d theta. All right, so area is sum of the AKs, so that'll be summation. Just copying what's right above 1 half F theta squared delta theta. Ooh, I should use the theta value we're using. Somewhere in here I got kind of lazy. So it's F, not F of theta, but F of theta sub k, which will be the kth theta value right there. So inside our ak formula, we have to use a particular uh, kth theta right there. So I'm just going, putting in our theta k like that. All right, the delta theta does not need to have a subscript because we're subdividing the same amount each angle. So as long as we're consistent right there, I don't, I can just say that delta K is the same for every single little slice we make, as long as we cut it up evenly. Uh, so this is an approximation, it's not equal. We are approximating here. And we'll go from K equals one to N. All right, how do we get the actual area without using a approximation? So we're gonna take a limit, which will turn into an integral. So limit n approaches infinity of this sum that's written above. And this turns into an integral. So the only things that change your theta k just turns into theta and your delta theta turns into d theta. And of course now we're going from some initial theta value to a final theta value. Your book uses alpha and beta for the initial angles, so I'll use that no notation. They're just using Greek letters for Angle, uh, angle variables and angle values. So that's why they're using the thetas and then the alpha and beta. All right, that's all there is to area. Right there. I would not say this is intuitive. So that's something you probably wanna memorize. It seems like there should be a pi in there, but we just did those computations and saw the pi actually cancels itself out. For example, find the area of the region enclosed by the cardioid. That's probably not spelled correctly. I doubt there's three vowels in a row. Probably not. So this is really similar to the last cardioid we looked at. The only difference is we're gonna multiply it by two and it's gonna be a one plus cos theta. So I can't just go back to that graph we had last section. We did one minus cosine theta last section. So this is one plus cos theta. That is how you spell cardioid. Really, IOI? There aren't many words with three vowels in a row. All right, so we could graph this out, but that could take a while. So let's think about the symmetry. All right, find the symmetry. 
So that should be back about two pages in your notes. We're going to find the symmetry. What's that? So make theta negative, and you'll get the same thing. And then think about, or just look back in your notes or your cheat sheet, when we make the theta negative, get the same thing. What symmetry do we have? So we got theta can be negative because cosine's even, so that negative theta won't change it, and that's flip over the x-axis. So I'm not showing many details at all on this paper here. So this is kind of the minimum amount of detail to show for symmetry. All right, when we make, we're gonna make a really fast table of values. Which quadrants should I use to uh, use x-axis symmetry? One and two. So we're just gonna go one and two, and then we'll flip with symmetry, flip it over to get three and four. So let's be really lazy and just do the three points. So zero, pi over two, and pi. So I got 0, 4, pi over 2, 2, and then pi, 0. Those are my three points I'm going to graph. So angle 0, go out 4. Pi over 2, go up 2. And then at the origin right there. So those are my three points. And so I'll graph them in a different color. Ooh. All right, I wrote down this is a cardioid. So from here, we should know the way it's going to look. So cardioids, there's four ways they could appear. They're basically like hearts, but they don't come to the point so much at the bottom. So it could be like that. It could be the upside down cardioid. That way or that way. My first one looks way too much like a heart. All right, which one of those do we have? So it looks like the third one. When we graph these, the point right here is generally going to be the origin right there. So we got the third one. So it's going to look about like that. Now x-axis symmetry, we're going to get the same shape underneath. So that's our cardioid. So we can use symmetry. If I use symmetry, the top half area equals the bottom half area. We have to think about what angles would correspond to the top half. So we can start at theta equals zero, and then just think of spinning around. So where would I stop before I hit the bottom half? Pi. I would stop right at pi. So I can go zero to pi and that will basically sweep through like that right there. So if we go zero to pi and double it, we'll get our area using symmetry. If I don't want to use symmetry, I would go zero to two pi. That would do the whole, sweep out the entire shape without using symmetry. 
So I'm just copying down from above the area formula that we had just written down, one half f theta squared d theta. From alpha to beta, we are going to double. So we're gonna go, I'm putting a two outside, so that's going from zero to pi. Our f of theta function is written above here in the table. f of theta is that two times one plus cos theta. Square that whole function, d theta. <coughs> so inside the big parentheses, that two times one plus cos theta, that whole thing is f theta. Make sure you square the whole thing, including the two. So that two is gonna get squared. So the two and the half cancel, we still have a two squared. We'll bring that outside. Now we square one plus cos theta, that's one plus two cos theta plus cos squared theta d theta. That was our symmetry, our doubling for the symmetry. And then the half was basically in the integral from the, when we computed what the area integral was. Okay, so you are in calculus three. So I think it might be somewhat insulting to finish this integral right now. You should be able to finish this integral on your own. So I'm going to leave it here. And in the notes, I'm just gonna go dot, dot, dot. I will talk briefly about how we'd integrate. All right, integral of one, that's trivial, that's theta. Two cos theta, super easy. Two sine theta is my guess, and I check it. All right, what about cos squared? We don't have a direct antiderivative for cos squared not cos cubed. How do we do cos squared? Did you do a trig sub or? We use the half angle formula. It's in the trig section or the double angle formula, one of the two. So you're gonna use the cos squared theta that should be on your cheat sheet. So you turn your cosine squared theta into cos two theta with this identity right here. We're not changing variables, so you're not gonna change your d theta at all. So now we're going to look at area between two curves, just like we did last time with rectangular coordinates. So we're gonna go inside, instead of talking about above and below, because above and below no longer really makes sense, we're gonna talk about inside and outside. So closer to the origin versus further away. That's how we're gonna measure which function is bigger, which one's smaller, what has a bigger radius. So we're gonna go for the area between two curves. So we'll go with R1 theta will be less than or equal to R2 of theta. So from that inequality, that means we wanna be outside R1 and inside R2. So that's what we mean by that inequality. So we're going to need to know our theta values. So theta is gonna be between some alpha and beta. So we're alpha and beta. Have the property that 
you generally want these to be positive. So R1 of theta is less than or equal to whatever the R is in between is less than R2 of theta. All right, way we're gonna calculate this is how we did it before. We're gonna get the big area and the small area and subtract them. So we're gonna do big area minus small area. So area in between is big area minus small area. So we'll write these two integrals out. So the first one will be integral from alpha to beta, one half. So there's two different curves. Uh, which one is the big R, R1 or R2? R2. So the way I wrote it, R2 is gonna be the big one. So this is R2 of theta squared d theta. So that's our big area small area, integral alpha to beta, one half r1 theta, squared d theta. What can I do using calculus to rewrite this? So I can turn it to one big integral so we're going from alpha to beta. And now I'm going to just basically move what's in the second one inside the first integral with subtraction. So we have one half r2 theta squared minus one half r1 <coughs> theta squared d theta. And I can factor the half out, bring it all the way out front. So we got R2 squared minus R1 squared d theta. This should look a lot like our difference of areas or volumes. Uh, before where we're subtracting but we need to square each of them first and then subtract so now we're going to find area inside the circle which will have the equation r equals one And outside, r equals one minus cos theta. So it says area inside the circle and outside the cardioid. So is the circle the big or the small? Circle's the big. Circle's the big. And that may seem weird because I want the area inside the circle but you want the area inside the bigger one, outside the smaller one. So that's how you want to think of it. So that means here is the big, is the circle, and the small is a cardioid. So the big we call it R2. R2 of theta is one. That seems like a silly function, but that's the function of theta right here, it's always, the radius always one for the circle. Cardioid is R1, so R1 of theta is one minus cos theta. So I wanna know when is R1 of theta less than or equal to R2 of theta? The easier way to answer this question, let's figure out when they're equal and then once we know the theta values are equal, we'll pick two adjacent theta values and figure out is the inequality going this way or the other way. So I'm gonna draw a really quick graph. The reason I can draw a quick graph is because we just graphed one minus cos theta in the last, not the last problem, 
but the last section. So I'm going to run back to that section quickly, graphing and polars, somewhere around here. Here's one minus cos theta graph. So I'm going to use this graph. And oh, look at that. We already have a circle of radius 1 inside. So we are inside the circle, inside the circle, outside the cardioid. So I'm going to redraw this shape right here, redraw this graph. So the cardioid's going to look like this. And the circle. Oh, did we have one and one where we intersected? I didn't really pay attention to those intersection points. Well, you know what? Let's pretend that I don't know what those are. We're going to find them with algebra. So we're going to find those two with algebra. How do I intersect two equations? I want to find theta values that have the same r value. So what can I do with r1 and r2 of theta? Set them equal. Figure out what theta gives me the same radius for both of those two. So I want to intersect r1 and r2. by setting r1 of theta equal to r2 of theta. r1 of theta is 1, no, r1 of theta is 1 minus cos theta. And r2 is 1, so we can, let's see, add cos to the other side and subtract 1, so we get 0 equals cos theta. That means theta is negative pi over 2, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2, etc, etc. I also could have gone more negative, so I can go either way. So I need to pick two adjacent theta values where my inequality goes the correct way. There are two adjacent theta values where my inequality would be reversed, and I don't want that. So I want to be inside the circle and outside the cardioid. Let's see, inside the circle, outside the cardioid. So I'm just going to rewrite the R1 theta as 1 minus cos theta less than 1. So let's try to just plug in pi over 2. If I plug in pi over 2 for theta, I have 1 minus cos pi over 2. Cos pi over 2 is 0. So 1 is less than 1. All right, what happened there? I picked a theta value, they're equal. So don't pick a theta value where they're equal. Pick a value in between. So what value is in between? negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, that's really easy. Zero. Zero. Usually I'll just go halfway in between those two numbers. If we fail at this one, we'll grab the number between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, which would be pi. So we're about to see, so we're going to try zero here. Theta, that's 1 minus cos theta. Is that less than 1? 1 minus cos 0. 1 minus 1 is 0. All right, 0 is less than 1. So that means between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, I have the cardioid is less than the circle for all those values. So I am going to use my interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. 
So going to my graph, that means I am hitting right at the negative pi over two and pi over two right there. That's where the circle's intersecting. The circle has a radius one. So the circle will, I should graph in orange. All right, so there's my circle. So any questions on the computations that we made? So now we're going to shade in the part of the graph that we're actually computing here. Inside the circle, outside the cardioid. I'll shade the entire circle. Don't do this right now. I'm going to hit undo in one second. So inside the circle, outside the cardioid. I can't shade everywhere outside the cardioid because I would use a huge amount of ink, but I'll just kind of shade the around the outside of the cardioid, not all over the paper everywhere. So I want to know where both of those are touching. So there's one region where those are overlapping. And it is the region I just colored in right there. So we're inside the circle, outside the cardioid. So that is obviously Batman's boomerang. So we're going to get the area of that. Can I use symmetry on this area? Sure can. So set up the integral to get the area. I want to zoom out. So I have that integral at the top of the board right there. I think, is that big enough to see everything? So take a minute and write out the area. You should have everything you need on the board here. It's a good time to ask questions if you're stuck.
So I got the area formula down here, and then the big, the R2 was one, and the R1 was one minus cos theta. I used symmetry, so I just went zero to pi over two instead of, and I doubled it with that two, instead of just going negative pi over two to pi over two. And the way we integrate this, you can FOIL the one minus cos theta out. And then the one will cancel the one, or the one will cancel the minus one, and you're just left with the other two terms, and you can integrate that right there. So it's the integral will go in a very similar way. I'm just gonna write dot, dot, dot. Now if you want, you can actually multiply these in a weird way. What you're looking at is a squared minus b squared, which is a minus b times a plus b. So a minus b will be cos theta. <coughs> That's a minus b right there. One minus one minus cos. The ones will cancel, you got just plus cos. And then a plus b. So when I add those two together, I'm gonna have two minus cos theta. So then you can multiply those out right there. <coughs> if you want, that's a slightly different way. Rather than foiling and canceling, you can go this route. Or you can just foil it out like you uh, would normally do. All right, last thing we're going to do is arc length. curve will be a function of theta and we're going to go between alpha and beta so x is r cos theta y is r sine theta I'm going to write out our arc length from last quarter so it's integral a to B square root. The way I'm going to write it is I'll, I'll do the one plus uh, F prime X squared and that really can be written as one squared plus F prime X squared DX. So that should seem familiar for arc length right there. Is that on somebody's formula page? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to do to change this around, I'm going to write 1 as dx over dx. Uh, F prime is dy over dx. And dx is just dx like that. I'm going to multiply by d theta over d theta. So that's the same as multiplying by 1 right there. So I'm going to do this in an algebraic way. So I'm going to move the d theta underneath the dx. Now I want to push the dx over d theta into the square root. So the way I'm going to do that is square it and square root it. So it's raised to a half power, so I can multiply it inside the square root. And when I do that, it 
when I do that I'm distributing to each of these parts so these are just squared so that means there's dx squared in the numerator then I'm going to cancel with the dx squared in the denominator so those dx's cancel like that, they're both squared. dx's cancel in the y term as well. And it's like I forgot to bring down the d theta. Bring that down. Now we s are switching into thetas, so I'm just gonna rename my endpoints alphas and betas. And so we got dx over d theta. Alright, so we're almost done. I want to turn these back into R uh, functions of theta. Ooh. So next is R cos sine theta, y equals R sine theta. So I'm going to find dx over d theta. I think we did this already, but we'll do it again. So I'm going to have r prime cos theta. So remember, r is a function of theta. So I'm taking a theta derivative. r, uh, r prime means dr d theta. So we get r prime cos theta plus r or minus r sine theta. And dy d theta is r prime sine theta plus r cos theta. Okay, so any questions about those right there? I'd like to factor an R out, but the problem is one of them is prime, one of them is regular R. So I can't just factor the R out because they're not the same. All right, now I think we're going to have some ugliness before we sort this out. So I'm going to take these substitutions, put them in for dx d theta and dy d theta. Well, let's do our algebra first. That's going to be crazy if we have to keep writing the integral alpha beta square root every single time. So I'm going to do the, I'm going to square them and subtract that, or square them and add them over here. So you're going to notice again and again there's going to be some trig that we're just going to expand out, be kind of ugly, and then it's going to simplify down. And the primary one uh, identity you're going to use is cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. That's going to be the main one you're going to be using over and over to cancel a lot of these out. So you do have to FOIL it. You're going to have six terms when you FOIL. Each one's going to turn into three terms, and then there should be some subtractions that cancel, and then some Pythagorean identity that's going to cancel also. And writing r prime squared, I strongly recommend don't write r to the 1, 2 power.
So use some extra parentheses to write r prime squared. So don't write r12 like that. That is not the way to write prime squared. Okay, so it's properly ugly. You got three terms from each each of those squared terms. So any questions on this expansion before we start canceling? So there is two terms that just completely cancel out to zero. Which two terms can I add up and get zero? So all those terms that are multiples of two. So one of them was a positive, that's the outside inside and the other outside inside. So those terms are gonna completely cancel out. So that gets rid of a lot of junk right there. So what's left over? I'm gonna group up the r prime terms first. So we got r prime squared cos squared plus r prime squared sine squared. And now the regular r terms, r squared, sine squared, plus r squared, cos squared. So now my favorite f word, we're going to factor right here. So factoring out the r prime squared from the first two terms and the r squared from the second terms. So we got r prime squared times cos squared plus sine squared plus r squared times sine squared plus cos squared. All right, what is cos squared plus sine squared? One. one, and then of course sine squared plus cos squared is one. At this point in calculus three class, you can just cancel those because we see that it's canceling in a product, so it's going to turn into a one, which doesn't matter when you multiply. So we're not canceling them out to zero, where I would, if I was canceling zero, I would erase or cross out the entire term. Just crossing out the multiply by cos squared plus sine squared. So we got r prime squared plus r squared. A lot of work. <laughs> but cancels out pretty nice. Now we're gonna take that and put that into the integral for that d, uh, x d theta, dy d theta squared, add it together. So that is just r prime, let's see, I think your book puts the r term first. So it's r theta squared plus r prime theta squared d theta and this is the arc length. All you need is that last form right there. So all that work we did was just to get down to this arc length computation. So arc length is probably one of the easiest types of questions to compute, or at least easiest one to set up, because I tell you where it starts, where it ends. You don't have to do big minus small and all that other fun stuff. So arc length are super easy to set up. And I'll put that, all that craziness on the board. Wow. It's not that bad when you know what you're doing. All right, what we're gonna do now is get the perimeter of the cardioid that we have been using. So we're gonna get the perimeter or the arc length of one lap of the cardioid. So 
So we already saw that going from 0 to 2 pi would be the entire cardioid. And I think this one was shaped like that right there. I could use symmetry and go 0 to pi, get the upper half, and double it. So or use symmetry, and we'll double the perimeter from 0 just to pi, like that. So I have r right there. I need to get r prime to use the length formula. So r prime derivative of 1 minus cosine is positive sine. So that's r prime. And we're ready to write up the arc length. So it's the integral square root r squared plus r prime squared d theta. Now we'll go alpha to beta. We're, of course, doubling. So I'll put that 2 outside from 0 to pi, square root. r squared is 1 minus cos squared plus sine theta squared d theta. So 1 minus cos squared, that's 1 minus 2 cos theta plus cos squared theta, second term is just sine squared theta d theta. All right, why would it be misleading to cancel cos squared plus sine squared in this context? They cancel to one. If I just cross it out like this, it looks like I'm canceling it to zero. So you want to be careful. I did pretty much this notation before, but it's because it was a uh, product, not a sum. So it'll cancel to 1, which will give me, instead of the 2, or instead of that 1 at f in the front, that'll turn into a 2. So I get 2 minus 2 cos theta. So this looks a little tricky here, but I remember there's a double angle formula I might be able to use. So if I factor the 2 out, I could have 1 minus cos theta square root d theta. Question? Oh. All right, so 1 minus cos theta. I'm going to write that uh, formula that uses 1 minus cos. 2 theta over 2 equals sine squared theta. However, I don't have 2 theta, I just have regular theta. So what I'm going to do is cut both of these angles in half. So it's 1 minus cos theta equals sine squared theta over 2. So I just took both of those angles and took half of them. I don't have the half here either, so I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. So that is what I'm going to substitute. This is an identity substitution, not a change of variable. So I don't need to pay the price of changing out d theta. We're still in the theta variable. So it's 2 times 2 sine squared theta over 2 square root d theta, integral 0 to pi. So I have 2 squared inside my square root, so that's going to come out of the square root just as a 2. Now I just have square root sine squared, theta over 2 d theta. So I did have square root of sine squared. Why does that cancel to absolute value of sine? 
and not just sine. Plus or minus. So it gets, it's because of plus or minus, but squaring makes a positive, and then square root would just give me the positive. Now, <coughs> once we're here, is sine going to be negative at all in quadrant one or two? Sine's going to be positive in one and two. So I don't have to turn this into a step function because it's automatically positive. If I did quadrant three or four, I'd have to be very careful and make it positive if I went to quadrant three or four. So last step, I'm not going to show. What do we have to do to find the antiderivative? I could guess and check. My guess would be cosine theta over 2 would be a good place to start. If I couldn't see the guessing and checking, if I couldn't get the guess, what, what technique would I use? U sub. So u is theta over 2, du, 1 half, d theta, and then you would u sub this in, find the antiderivative, unsubstitute, plug in the endpoints. Okay, any questions on, I know we're going fast at the end, but most of this should have been review from calculus 2 class, or even calculus 1. You're going to find you're going to do a lot of algebra now, hopefully quickly. You've had a lot of practice doing algebra at this point.